Um, good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's event. Um, One Book, One Bronx, the Leonard Leaf Library, the Africana Studies Department, the Women's Studies Department, and the School, and the School of Arts and Humanity at Lehman College, uh, CUNY Center for Humanities, and Lift Every Voice, Lift Every Voice have collaborated to present a series of eclectic programs and readings and reading groups as part of a nationwide initiative, Lift Every Voice, Why African American Poetry Matters. Lift Every Voice is a year-long national public humanities initiative sponsored by the Library of America and the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture that seeks to engage participants in a multifaceted exploration of African American poetry, the perspectives it offers on American history, and the ongoing struggle for racial justice um, and the universality of the imaginative response to, to the personal experiences of Black Americans over three centuries. Tonight, we present Sisters in Struggle and Song, a reading and conversation with Mariposa Fernandez, Latasha N. Nevada Diggs, and Patricia Spears Jones. This event is part of our ongoing celebration of the Library of Congress's, uh, excuse me, the Library of America's uh, history-making anthology, uh, African American Poetry, 250 Years of Struggle and Song, edited by Kevin Young. And we're celebrating, in particular, these three poets tonight um, and their place within the Black poetic tradition. Before we get started, we want to let you know that live interpretation uh, of tonight's event in American Sign Language will be provided by interpreters Amber's, Bert, excuse me, Amber Bertolo and Candace Lane. We will, we will be spotlighting, however, is currently speaking, the person who is currently speaking along with one of the interpreters throughout the, throughout the evening but you should also be able to select and pin speakers in your instant in your instance of zoom as the attendee or choice speaker or gallery view in your zoom if that's your preferred experience thank you amber and candace for your work tonight i'd like i'd now like to turn it over to betran benon chair of lehman college's department of africana studies who will be who will give some welcoming some welcomes on behalf of Lehman and introduce the poets. Uh, Dr. Benone will also be leading the Q and A following each reading. Um, Dr. Benone, thank you, Ron. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. We are so delighted to have you all in our midst tonight for a wonderful evening uh, of, of poetry reading. We hope next time we'll be on our beautiful campus, but for now, uh, we will say thank you for Zoom. So uh, poetry is something we treasure at Lehman College and uh, all year round, we organize such events. And this one uh, is, is very special with uh, three of our uh, constituency or even four with the School of Arts and Humanities. Uh, that will be the Department of Africana Studies, the program in Women's Studies, Women and Gender Studies, uh, Leonard Lab, uh, Library, and the School of Arts and Humanities. This is how much we are interested uh, in, in poetry, especially in this special month that is ded dedicated to poetry. I, uh, I'm going to introduce our uh, poets tonight, uh, starting with Patricia Spears Jones. She's a poet, educator, cultural activist, anthologist, and recipient of the 2017 Jackson Poetry uh, Prize. And she is the author of Elucent Fire New and Selected Poems and three full length collection of five child books. She co-edited the groundbreaking anthology, Ordinary Women 
an anthology of New York City women in 1978, and Think, Poems for Aretha Franklin, Inauguration Day hat in 2009. You all remember that hat at President Barack Obama's inauguration. Her poems are widely anthologized, most notably in Of Poetry and Protest, from Emmett Till to Trayvon Martin. Bach's Best American Experimental Writing, 2016 and World, an anthology by a gathering of tribes and lift every voice. Why African American poetry matters today. And in The New Yorker, Dark Matters, sorry, Women Witnessing dot com and the Brooklyn Rail. Please join me to welcome Patricia Spear Jones. Everybody can be clapping where you are and I'm feeling the energy. Thank you. Our next poet is a writer, vocalist, and performance sound artist, Latasha and Nevada Diggs. She is the author of Twerk, published in Belladonna, 2013. Diggs has presented and performed at California Institute of the Arts, El Museo del Barrio, the Museum of Modern Art, and Walker Art Center at festivals, including Explore the North Festival, Leuve Warden, hope I got it right, in the Netherlands, Hekje Festival, Abu Dhabi, International Poetry Festival of Romania, Question of Will, Slovakia, Poesy Festival Berlin, and the 2015 Venice Biennale. As an independent curator, artist, director, and award for poetry from the Foundation of Contemporary Art, a Whiting Award, and a National Endowment for the Art Literature Fellowship, as well as grants and fellowships from Cave Canem, Creative Capital, New York Foundation for the Arts, and the US Japan Friendship Commission, among others. She lives in Harlem. Again, let us welcome Latasha Nevada Diggs. Our third poet tonight is Mariposa Maria Teresa Fernandez an award-winning Afro-Puerto Rican poet, spoken word performance artist, visual artist, educator, activist, scholar, and bronze native. Her poetry has been published in <coughs> African American Poetry, 250 Years of Struggle and Song, the Norton Anthology of Latino Literature the Afro-Latina Reader, History and Culture in the United States, Manteca, Anthology of Afro-Latina Poets, Bromdosh, The Page, A Deaf Poetry, Jam and Latina, an Anthology of Struggles and Protests in the 21st Century, United States. She has been featured on HBO Latino in the critically acclaimed series, Hablaya and Americanos, Latino Life in the US. Mariposa has performed throughout the United States and abroad, including Cuba, Germany, and South Africa. She is a CUNY faculty member and teaches at Lehman College in the Women and Gender Studies Program and the Africana Studies Department, as well as the Black Studies Program at City College of the City University of New York. 
Mariposa is a proud recipient of the 2020 CUNY Adjunct Incubator Grant and working on a project documenting stories of neighborhood and community resilience in the South Bronx. Please let us welcome our own Mariposa. Without further ado, uh, we are going to uh, hear our poet for the evening. Starting with Patricia Spear Jones. Okay, I thought it was going to be Latasha. Oh, Latasha is the <laughs> first? Yeah. Okay, I followed uh, the order I have here. So over to Latasha uh, Nevada Deeds, please let us welcome her. Hello, everyone. Um, so, uh, Rob, I, I don't know uh, if I need to, will you, will you handle that? Okay, okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you again, uh, Lehman College. Uh, and Mariposa for the invitation. Truly honored to be a part of this and to join Mariposa as well as Patricia Spears Jones in this reading. Uh, thank you to the Literary Freedom Project and Ron, as always, doing the work and making it happen, you know. Uh, thank you to the Library of America for. Uh, really making this uh, publication of this anthology um, happen. I'm extremely honored to be part of it, um, to be included in this later, this, this most recent anthology. And anthologies are always tricky, because what do they mean? Um, but thank you so much, Library of America, and the editor, Kevin Young, really. Um, I'm, 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 I'm really, really grateful for the inclusion. Um, I'm going to read uh, first my poem from the uh, book, Twerk, my only book, my only like full collection, <laughs> uh, which was included in the anthology. Um, thank you so much, Candice um, and Amber. I really appreciate ASL. Uh, you don't know how much I really appreciate it. It is another language and I'm grateful to see you, to see you. Okay, <laughs> so let me get going. My first Black nature poem. There is a dark mass following me. These legs are clumsy. They flap quickly. I want to slow them down, but my nerves, Lord, these pensive endings. The sun slumps against the merging fall on red leaves, and where the natives are unenlightened, the mass comes closer. Only white people swim in lakes nowadays, you know. Crystal Lake. Never seen a black person jump in a lake, let alone a river till this summer. The Bronx River is said to be clean. We care about clean. A month before, two boys drowned in the Bronx River. A week after, a boy jumps into it unfazed. Abandoned tires, relics of its sewer days, red herring spark, no fear, and a publicly funded park with a biology class, a boat making workshop for the children of Hunts Point. Gives me hope we wet our hair again. These follicles don't surf, don't swim. But here in Virginia, there's little comfort. The blush current from underwater springs makes me tense. White people form groups to paddle on boards across the Hudson, taking on trends from Hawaii. They tap into the yesterdays of a glunk in tongues, Wappinger, Mohican, a sporty new age like Gouda convenience, a luxury to admire when long beaches too far and rock away too dirty. Black folk don't swim. We splash and cool off. We are ways forward from a splendor hint of Senegalese manliness diving from a ferry miles offshore from Goree. 
That water got too much memory. We much prefer chlorine. That salt and fresh water are hypertension. And that ocean is curiously scary. And this lake is charmed and churning with tales from the deep. Profound is this river of B-rated torture. Deep a shadow people speculated through my rave tangerine goggles. On Lake Champlain at night, the chilly air felt like a presence. Swamp monsters, this ain't a swamp. Tubular amphibians, they be in rivers. Aquatic reptilians, ancestors distraught and vengeful like Jason. But this is smaller and gnawing like chiggers. Something from my weed days could live down here. My arms fight the green clearness. So mud olive, I cannot see the bottom. Beneath me is crisp. A fallen branch is mistaken for an ill. Uh, the next uh, couple of poems I'm gonna read are haikus and I'm calling them hot flash haikus. Um, and if you're going through hot flashes, you know what I'm talking about. And haikus just seem like the perfect thing to yeah, fitting. So here's a couple of hot flash haikus. Let me say I am a sparrow, scared to crash land my ass on raw nuts. Today I saw fly off sparrow with toilet paper rolled up and ready. Tenement starlings, shadow rockers, then bubble, rum, pa pa pum pum pum. Sorry to be late. AC broke, and these flashes keep me in panties. Cooped pulsed Club Nouveau, tongue tart from Irish spring mist, what the Blue Jay said. How the hooks unhooked, ready to feed you guava. You trained my bra well. Your taste is settled tang on the corner of lips, washing down Aki. Okay, so much for those. Next poem, pigeon poem, pigeon toe. And I will say there are some words that are in Japanese, um, some words in Maori, um, there's some words in Spanish. Um, I tend not to provide translations and um, I'd just rather you hear me, um, hear the sounds of the words, hear me attempt to pronounce them and forgive me, any native speakers of these languages. Um, I do my best, I try my best. It's all with love and respect. Pigeon toe. On the sake menu, no descriptive, like quiet and smooth, lean and firm. Dry seems redundant. The comedic paws that carry so much in a tree lettuce. When the flesh breaks, erangi namu glimmer free itself to become sky misty on the temple. A strait of islands set against a hazel setting in a de west. Colopoyo. Morning is belated afternoon where morning dove and starling sing their melody of five songs which scratch at nickel clouds. Shadows showcase loose silver quejetas, aroja, their claws carving tools, their beaks pick and sift gravel. It's said in a myth that the rooster was sent down from heaven to shape the earth, that the world was once all water, that the rooster no call out bo kokohua, what you create with yours out of wood, metal, and lacquer. The descriptive begin again, dreamy, rea, reka, reka, ignari ia miere, ai, dry is practical perhaps necessary for the lineage, perhaps necessary to protect the heart. The sky neither dust nor Honolulu azure. The sparrow medley now 
tree or two. The manner of things arrive when the sun cracks, the pastel smear, in the end, e takuhoa umau urotu, the hair gladly protests shampoo, e taku tamitane nyaro moke moke. In the end, Gochira get devoured by Sandower. Mioyu. Little Iyawo on the fade on. Straight ain't a directional ornament. Tempo is here. Strips of newsprint. Wheat pays onto your Nana sharecropper's wall. So too is Oshum's needle. Rummage contents of well oil as bare piss bottles catch spirits. The crystal road is a rule blingless one. Down and up wind up the ocean. Sign the agogo for Omolu. Mareje arcos eris. Feitu para bobos. Love struck passages in the Dilogun. Buzios bedazzle would be brides whose rings are invisible in the cross hatch of scrap pot holders. A coconut drops the needle. A linea nunca ajeta. This poem is indirect, meant unfixed. Cease resistance. Spirits might enter. Spirits might escape. Rust up nostril. Ogum's dandruff. Unkaishi bites like a reminder like how silica cuts into the lungs for wampum, purple and white, whelk and cowhog clam, prestige enclosed like gold chains, Chinese brass coins like Mr. T, like indicators of worth and obligation, birth, no direct meaning, no straight line, just a quilt of celestial ibeji trickery. Akiora as flavor flave, a present a check me sanga, uma scene, uma now, a Chelsea's bow ain't broke, arrow ain't bent, he be forchy with that Angola swag. Oshumare handle that. So minchi alinea, the row of glass risen seeds, my lineage be a slave trade, be a fur trade, be a horse trade, be a dingy trade, be a ivy trade, be a 1492 misdirection, be a way away a trapped in Venetian Murano, be strung on dare tendon. Give me the loot, give me the tax, break the pattern. These lines never be direct. Flash the spirit. Esas líneas nunca saujetas. I'm going to skip this poem to Candice. Next poem is Cling with a quote. Child with continuing cling issue, no. In his final fire, Gwendolyn Brooks. Sapphires are lovely. Star of Bombay revered by child. She embodies its six rays replacing spoiled limbs. With heat, she hopes to change her lackluster. Halt the continuing spectrum a cousin sapped from her. A vampire's cling. She remembers his as cornflower blue. A distracting issue a lover is not guilty of. How does he no, it's a turn off. His dick cannot enter her that way nor retire to any position. No moment to gaze without the recall. Shadows cannot swing in the amber light. She admires little, if at all. A final twinge when lover pinch upon Crayola, blush, fire. Jesus, children of America. Hear mama muddle moan. Her spirit a high, a sour high moan. From covers moving words muffled move parallel. Can't stand for nothing cause mama can't stand upright medicated on fortified. View mama case record a feet high from a record crate. No rose sweeter save maybe those dried in Bibles. Self-taught hand-sewn hymns, high water. Transfer in marrow, narrow men, wax thee. Whip her and me wholly. 
Care saves no one near a pint of chilled transcendental. Common sense in common areas see mama overrun, raggedy redeemer, mourned markings, hook scars on skull, vicious vex seedy arenas, mama drowned in high gutter, raw murmur, only boy still born. Now mama ration muscatel, misery loves company, mania mascot, see seven Marys in a tree, ain't one Mary was mama to mama, rake at this mildewed memoir that black mold will get you holy roller soliciting for a muse rescue me rescue my mauled mama i come from midlife's noir daughter of a negro explorer not at the south pole at the north pole hawk the rabbit trim darling the iconographic halo shadows your stare. Whose barber makes the grooming regal, what do you point towards? Silver leaf children pray to your Nikes, tangerine and blood and japaned leather. Can you see father? Hold the pose, Henson's legacy, descended of Inuit, cloud bursts of wonderful sexy. His is your bequest, sea man and Arctic booty, clock wolves. Rock the navigator. Hand over your barbecue well meat. Polar bear and little Louis French kiss. Mirror, mirror at the ball. Warris blubber carved with your sword. Foreign familiar. Lime cargoes reflect the cold tundra sun. Your name, Anoakak of the polo grounds. Where's your father? Perp contest. The dog sled as prop, chiseled Arabian, your palate companion, bitch walk. I'm going to skip um, the next poem, um, Interpreters. And I'm going to go to Imprint. Mist highs most of most, vinyl discs spin whiskey. Usher. Girl, wrist, ill, rhymes, sigh. This is so twisted. Slob lying while post picks of shop lips. Will sibling smirk or cry. Cost of wisp of sip of God. Our fish and chips dish dish in ditch. Ask only for fools. Drink on finicky dicks. In ditch mama slip on vomit. Tilt flick to moy. Twist of spit, gosh, in pit, filled with milk. Etched on billing, confirm this toot, gosh. Stir night in tin snuff box. Lost most bills with tricks, split two to six shifts. Spliff, nilch, tits, lit, gosh. She's gifted. And my final poem, The Bag Lady Remix. Is you window seat on Euro rail, dejected ballads on loop, dragging one line so it carries to no ear? Is you sanitation man shucking muck? Is you your lungs caught? Is you salad, arugula, you choke? A container of novelty totes. Is you carry ons dragging up gates, mistakes, crowding up time whilst misery winds? Is you broken hourglass with grievances invalid? Is you weakeners overweight near freight? Is you things piled? A horde of is you is a forget to take it down to goodwill? Is you me and I trafficking emojis so manila? Is you a pallet dawn? Soap scarf, Satan salty. Don't it feel like a relapse? Ache like a rheumatic, fever, hoodoo for issues. What closets need ain't mothballs but therapy? Is you the cringe at baby showers, acid reflux, the minuscule? You is. Love don't make it better for him, him, and oh yeah, her. Huh? Hourglass moan every year over packed fluttering rheumatoid. Is you pregnancies not? Is you a husband dreams of rot or dies? Is you mix mattress and flights abroad? The tick, boom. Is you passe? Your world spin faster. Sunshine so void. Average. 
Talk is a strange, ain't you lucky? Gratitude is you three wishes lapse, old previews too punishing. In the corner, the time out headlocked, it's true, forgive you fast away them once. Is you what you willed so much the old lady stopped asking? For you on point with black caster, always making your plane don't transfer new attractions. A mask is you, smiles and argon. Bergamot, heart song and black pepper is you till infinity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Latasha. Uh, everybody, uh, please uh, join me, whatever you can do, you know, just to uh, really uh, celebrate uh, these uh, powerfully woven words uh, with very strong imagery, ideal phones and onomatopoeia and original languages and dialects. And I'm sure you're going to tell us more about that uh, uh, later. Uh, we are going to take questions at the end of uh, the three readings. So please just uh, write down your questions while we continue with our second reading with Mariposa. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. It's so good to be here. I'm so happy, humbled, and honored to be sharing space and time with Latasha and Nevada Diggs and Patricia Spears Jones, my sisters in struggle and song. I would like to just thank. Lehman Library, especially Robert Farrell, for all the work you put into planning this. Thank you, Ron Kavanaugh from One Book, One Bronx. Of course, Library of America, the Center for Humanities, and all the folks that helped to promote this event at the Poetry Foundation. And um, I'm just so happy. Welcome to my students to family, to longtime friends. I see people here joining us from as far away as Puerto Rico. Um, bienvenidos, thank you and welcome. I would like to dedicate my reading tonight and it's, I shared this on social media that it's humbling and a little mind boggling to think that um, when I started writing poetry as a child at 11 years old, that I would be included in this literary history in this trajectory that begins with Phyllis Wheatley and Lucy Terry Prince. It's a little mind boggling and deeply humbling and affirming. So I'd like to dedicate my reading to all the little black and brown girls who are out there writing your hearts out in your marble note, composition notebooks. Um, and I'd like to dedicate my reading to our ancestors, especially to my mother. My first poem, love poem for Ntozaki and me, to the one and only Ntozaki Shange. Because of you, I believe in sisterhood and soulful sunshine translated into song, accidental genius, and rainbow rivers, like the river that led me to you. Dreams come true, true love on wings of poetry, roaring African savanna lions, lying peacefully with the once hunted, butterflies dancing gracefully with the once haunted. Because of you, I believe in the peace found in healing, the healing that can only be found an experience translated into words, translated into shared testimony, translated into bonds of true connection. And because I am one of those colored girls who survived inescapable rites of passage, which compelled me to consider suicide, to then by God's mercy and grace, discover the you and me who set her own self free. As I uncovered my own strength in and on stages, found salvation within the pages of a poet who survived to tell her story and survived by telling it. 
And to Zaki, thank you for the courageous example to find and act on the means to reclaim the lost innocence of my Black Boricua Bronxenia girlhood to create a beautiful mosaic of dreams shouted into a million fragmented pieces, to give birth to a new universe of purpose and conviction, a work of art in an open sky of inspiration for all the black and brown girls like me, born free, born with the divine right to be on this planet, to be loved, valued, and respected, because of you, I am a poet who believes not in writing poems on L-shaped desks with lakeside views, but in birthing poems on tile floors back up against wooden doors. I am a poet who believes in creation, in writing poems to inspire the next generation. I am a poet who believes in fire tears to cleanse the soul, cast a cascade down to make you whole and healing thunder laughter. And I thank God that the rainbow was enough to birth a thunder goddess who birthed a rainbow, who birthed Entezaki sunshine, moonlight, and stardust all over the place. As muses sparkled honey kisses on your beautiful baby girl face. Entezaki, I love you. Pen to paper. <laughs> pen to paper, salsa dancing, Spanglish speaking, soul seeking, Africana diaspora diva. And Tazaki, I believe in you. You are the iridescent rainbow reflection, constantly reminding me to believe in myself. You lowered rainbows into sewers, saving the lives of black girls like me, sashaying colorful head wraps, hoop earrings, bangle bracelets, and sweet oil perfume. You sing survival into words, into epics, into rainbow colored Broadway lights, into the consciousness of our time, our collective memory, our collective survival. To know you is a blessing. To be hugged warmly, to look into your beautiful coffee eyes that whisper this poem, this poem is for you. These words, this time, this breath is for all the color girls who considered suicide, but instead held their own candlelight vigils in marble notebooks, waiting for the arrival of first light, who fought demons all night, who know that dawn is really a woman, the backdrop of a beautiful black sky and a rainbow laying sexy on her side. Frost led me to you. And because of you and Tazaki, I know that sometimes the greatest of poems are birthed in the agony of headaches, stomach aches, and heartache, somewhere deep within the quiet peace of my soul, poems that make me whole, poems that set me free. And Tazaki, gracias. Thank you. Thank you so much, Candice. That was so amazing. Just finger snaps and <laughs> fire to you. The next one is Ode to the Diasporican. Mira mi cara Puerto Riqueña, a mi pelo vivo, a mis manos morenas. Mira mi corazón que se llena de orgullo y dime que no soy boricua. Some people say that I'm not the real thing. Boricua, that is. Because I wasn't born on the Enchanted Island, because I was born on the mainland north of Spanish Harlem, because I was born in the Bronx. Some people think that I'm not bona fide because my playground was a concrete jungle, because my Rio Grande de Luisa was the Bronx River, because my Fajardo was City Island, my Luquillo Orchard Beach. And summer nights were filled with city noises instead of coquis and Puerto Rico was just some paradise that we only saw in pictures. What does it mean to live in between? What does it take to realize that being Boricua is a state of mind, a state of heart, a state of soul? Mira mi cara Puerto Riqueña, a mi pelo vivo, a mis manos morenas. Mira mi corazón que se llena de orgullo y dime que no soy boricua. No nací en Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico nació en mí. Thank you.
Thank you, Amber. The next one is called Bronx Cicadas. It was important to select some happy poems. We need that. Black joy. In the Bronx of our childhood, where we walk down the hill on 213, past the creepy abandoned Victorian house on Carpenter, chip blue paint fading watercolor against the sky, where the scary dog in the alleyway behind the rusty fence barked at us each and every time, down the block to the boulevard, where the green leaves hung low and luscious, where our hearts were never heavy, where the river smelled like muddy water, sparkled green like the Bronx River does after rainy days. Bronx Park Boulevard, Boulevard of Playgrounds, Rosewood and Shoelace Park, bocce courts where old Italian men played wearing brown fedoras, crispy white shirts, and brown pants held up by suspenders. Park of the cobblestone horseshoe that still stands, Park of the smelly, spooky echo of the Williams Bridge underpass, where years ago, before our time, a farm stood. Morning dew on fresh grass, oak trees, weeping willows, and pine, where we chased fireflies and white cup, buttercup butterflies, watched fireworks explode in the black sky on the 4th of July. Snowball fights and sledding down the hill on 219 after being pulled for blocks by my big brother, my brother's park, where the Boulevard Lions played touch football, ripped jeans, curly throws, long hair flying in the wind, where they broke night under the stars, standing on wooden benches above the packed snow. Dunn gathered all the dead Christmas trees for smoky boulevard bonfires where new trees were sure to grow. Dark winter nights soon blossom into sunny spring sunrise, radiating glow, constant river flow, humming sound of speeding cars on higher ground in tow on the Bronx River Parkway. Zoom! <sighs> Summer again, sunny, hot, and hazy. Dandelion wishes all summer long. Boom boxes with, with mixtapes where we hung on the chain link fence by the baseball, by the basketball courts, eating ices on the swings, sailed on wooden seesaws, chip yellow paint carved up, fresh graffiti layups on concrete walls, climbed old school monkey bars, ran wild, scraped our knees and played hopscotch when my brother taught us how to ride a bike in the stomping grounds reveling of our youth, dreaming in the whispers of our river and the music of the boulevard through the dog days of summer sun rays where the sound of a Bronx day rattled long and hard like mysterious maracas in the trees. Where they rattled long and loud, long and loud. <laughs> the next poem is called 1980 for the child victims of the Atlanta child murders. And I'd like to add in that dedication um, to all stolen lives, to all the stolen lives of Black children. 1980 wasn't special, except it was the year I turned nine and became an activist. My eyes glued to the six o'clock news. Fear floats in the swirls of 13 channels. Grows, 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 like the cold dead bodies of Black children into questions my mother does not answer. 1980, the year I learn against my fragile will, the sting of hatred and wicked words that, that crush my spirit. Years before the word racism enters my vocabulary. 1980, the year between 1979 and 1981, when more than 40 black children are kidnapped and slaughtered in Atlanta, far away. Far away from the Bronx, my mother assures me, not far enough. The danger zone is as close as the nearest television and for some 
odd reason close enough that we are not, no longer allowed to stray too far from the house. 1980, a year of morbid child curiosity, a strange need to know if any more bodies of black children were found strangled or stabbed or shot, if they had found the killer or killers as they speculated the rise of KKK sinister aspirations to wipe out future black generations. 1980, only one year in the span of American childhood nightmares, where I dreamed myself trapped in the black airless trunk of a slow moving car, where I'd see my own child face posted with the many small disappeared faces looking so much like mine, mostly boys, but some girls hair braided and adorned with rainbow colored barrettes, barrettes like mine. 1980, another year of no justice and no peace. The year before the Atlanta police found that black man with the thick glasses and the big Afro and said he was the killer. Killing the dead count at 28. Forgetting about missing bones, doomed to forever remain missing from their mamas and their papas and a proper burial. 1980, the year my mother gave me a big white button with bold green letters attached to a green satin ribbon that read, save the children, that I proudly wore pinned to my school uniform as I marched off to school, now part of the growing movement to save the children. I felt, I felt somehow protected by this button, felt that I, I could save the children and somehow save myself by wearing it that somehow I was connected to all the people who went down to Atlanta to save the children, the activists and church leaders who joined the mothers and the people led by hound dogs and psychics and even the New York City guardian angels with their red berets and black leather jackets. 1980, the year I ran home after school, salty tears in my eyes. What are you doing wearing that button? Mrs. Mangione asked me in the schoolyard. You're not black. Rolling the word off her tongue like something you wouldn't want to catch. You're Puerto Rican. Emphasis on poor. To put me in my place. 1980. Just the year of my first encounter with race. The year I start paying close attention to the news. The year I became a part of a movement. The year I asked my mother, is it true I'm not black? The year my mother tells me, Puerto Ricans have black Indian and Spanish blood. The year I asked my mother, does that mean my blood is black too? The year she tells me, your blood is red like everybody else's. The year I gather a bit more evidence to not trust white people. 1980 wasn't special at all, except it was the year my mother made an activist of me. The year I proudly wore my button. The year I said nothing to that Italian lady in the schoolyard, but went home, looked in the mirror, and for the very first time said to myself, I too am black, save the children. Thank you. And this is the last poem. I just wrote this poem. It's dedicated to the people of the Bronx. It's dedicated to, um, the Bronx Wide Coalition, which I'm a part of. And uh, it's, it's called Our Bronx, hashtag Our Bronx. A Bronx medley, Bronx happy, Bronx love poem for the People's Bronx Assembly. Mic check, mic check, check out this power deck. The people are speaking, speaking and working for the people working for the people because we be the people. We be the people of the Bronx, the Bronx that is our Bronx, cradled between whispering rivers, salty ocean, cityscape and blue sky, between sirens, struggle and song. We be Bronx strong, making history, our own history, where we create our fate, true to our name. We lay claim to our own narrative of the Bronx that is our Bronx. We be who we are and we be who we be. And it's all good in the hood, except when you try to take away what we fought for after surviving all that we've survived. It's unimaginable, almost laughable to think that you think we'd roll over and die or hang our heads and cry after so many losses. Think we'd be whipped, have our faith dictated by landlords and bosses. Think we'd be stripped 
stripped of our rights and our dignity? Think again. This is our Bronx and our future that we fight back and fight forward for. Think we'd give in? This is our Bronx and our future that we fight back and fight forward for. Think we'd give in? Give our lives over to a political party coin toss? Think again. This is our Bronx and our future that we fight back and fight forward for. Think we'd give in? Into a politician's promises and whims? Think again. This is our Bronx and our future that we fight back and fight forward for. Think we give in, give in to the politics of a society where we have to call the police on the police as if that would save us. Think again, this is our Bronx and our future that we fight back and fight forward for. Our Bronx, a future that is our fight to have, to live inside this Bronx land, to be happy, to live with dignity, to live in peace, justicia con paz, free from violence on our own terms, dismantling injustice on a systemic level, fighting for racial justice, gender justice, for economic democracy, for all of us, for the youth and the elders, for clean air, for our human rights, for the human right to breathe, for healthy food, fighting back and fighting forward for all of us, for justice, to abolish barges and prison bars, blocking our sight from the moon and the stars, fighting back and fighting forward for our freedom and health and sunshine and peace of mind. We are the Bronx, flame keepers, teachers, organizers, workers, activists, artists, poets, Revolutionaries, courageous people, Bronx people, essential people, Bronx people, essential people, Bronx people, essential people. And we keep moving forward and we keep on keeping on. We be old school drum beats. We be who we be. We be the music, the music of this Bronx medley. We be the co-authors of our own story of this Bronx happy love poem medley, where we collectively spread our wings and take light, planting the seeds and digging our heels deep in the trenches, taking a people stand for this Bronx land. This Bronx, which is whose Bronx? Our Bronx. Whose Bronx? Our Bronx. Whose Bronx? Our Bronx. Balante. Thank you. Thank you, Amber. Thank you, Candice. I also, I would like to thank Kevin. I didn't say Kevin Young. Thank you, Kevin Young, in case I didn't get to say it. And Mary Sutton, shout out to Mary Sutton. And thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for another moving tribute, dedication to our ancestors to black and brown youth, an affirmation of our rich heritage, code switching in our multiple languages uh, that make us. Again, uh, make sure to write down your questions. We're going to fill them uh, after the third reading. And I know many of you are clapping and this is just a wonderful evening. So we will continue with Patricia Spears Jones. Welcome, Patricia. Thank you so much, Dr. But um, this has just been wonderful, and I want to thank Mariposa for uh, getting the fire under everybody to do this. Thank you, Robert Farrell, all the people at Lehman College, uh, the Library of America. Kevin Young um, and the anthology. It's huge, by the way. Uh, so if you get, get a copy, uh, be sure that you have some space to put it. Bookshelf, otherwise you may have some problems. I am going to read um, not very many poems, but they're all kind of uh, sort of responding to the theme of this evening. And I'm gonna start with one um, that's a golden shovel. Uh, which was a form that Terence Hayes uh, created uh, based on Gwendolyn Brooks's Golden Shovel poem. 
And this is a golden shovel using a line uh, from uh, Brooks's poem. Um, and the line is, uh, my dreams, my work must wait till after hell. The poem is after hell. You can trace my bitter words, my words and yours. Who knows how our dreams will turn out? Will they turn out? My days like snakes are slow moving cold. Works in the docket, love in my pocket. I must situate my situation. Now I have to wait for shimmer to shake me down. Yes, till the very tears I fought for dry up and after them all is paradise after this frigid hell. Uh, Miss Brooks's poems were uh, part of a series called Gay, uh, of sonnets called Gay Chaps at the Bar. And she wrote them when all these black soldiers were going off to uh, fight in World War II and their um, voices in this an incredible series. Um, and uh, she gave us a lot. And there's a lot of her in the anthology, so be prepared. An American Haze uh, opens with a line from the poet Brenda Hillman. And you should just remember that if you are a volunteer who leaves food and water for, people, for migrants in the deserts in Arizona and Texas, you will be arrested uh, for doing that. Uh, there's an incredible anti-humanitarian streak uh, in the country. <laughs> anyway, an American hate. Quote, a thunderclouds cracks and volunteers, unquote. Trumpeter lilies argue the loudest scent. You could wrap a fiesta with that smell. And when done, you will know you're at a funeral parlor and tears are falling, falling. Stars brighten dancing figures, the ones that Jasper Jones remixes, old elderly DJ, got that pepper in his pocket, who knows these people in the desert. Volunteers come with food and water left for desperados, the men, women, children stumbling into an American haze. They too, these volunteers, are illegal, told to leave the desert on footprinted, even as the men, women, children mark the earth, calling on insects, birds, and beasts to follow, to gather, to take what is left of the stumbled body. The border between good and evil can be porous, or hard as steel, or an ideology of hatred. The country is full of ideologues, and the border cracks. The next poem was occasioned by the horrible death of Nia Wilson a young black woman who was killed by a white supremacist in Oakland, California, about three years ago. Uh, Nia also means purpose in Swahili. Nia. It sounds better in Spanish, recario, prettier, as if, if it isn't what it is, and there's that, oh, my. How will the rent get paid, the deadline met, and who ghosted me first, Sally Lover or that other one? Delicacy of skin, quick steps, quick stops, and the direction is, what? There's no where there, and the last shift is the one where tongues load a stack of size, bridge tall and mythic. This day and the next, volcanic shards roll towards the door, even if mountains are in the far distance, thousands of miles. How the heart steadily beats as the sirens careen and angry men launch their best lives ever 
by taking so many others? It is a miracle. This heart steadily beating even as the next question threatens a late spring storm. Ground broken by lightning, the rain drops rhythmic pattern, honors cushion it. Those that beat, beat, beat their instrument with a purpose. Nia, knowing how one off Beat, collapses the genesis, augurs partial storm, but the purpose becomes precarious, for death enters white armed, white roaded, where the body drops like lightning on rain moist ground. Now the next poem is a true invention. I have no idea if Edda James ever met Malcolm X. I don't even know if she ever played the Audubon Ballroom. But hey, I'm a poet. I can make this one. So there you go. Edda James at the Audubon Ballroom. Plus, finally, I get to write a poem where Malcolm X gets to be really sexy in the poem. Okay. Edda James at the Audubon Ballroom. Someone knocks over a chair, drunk one. Fight ready, but this vivid sound stops fist. Who let them big black birds in? Again, this night, what? Fight, fight. Let's try dancing the blues to smithereens. Wrestle up those moans and sighs for the good working Henrys of this world. Ready, ready, ready to block and hustle. Shit and cuss you out. Somewhere backstage, the money scatters. Your skin beams weakness while your voice screams, where's the fucking fun out? Your chest blossoms possibilities, gets thick enough to swing which way and oh my, there he stands. In suit sharp as steel and shoes, Patent leather, squarish frames, that wise guy demeanor, the tip chapeau. You picked up the high heel shoe you throwed down, then repaired your makeup for that second set, the one that promises a better crowd. Another chair tips back as smoke swarms the litter stage. You're too young for this mess and he'll never grow up. Uh, this also references a wonderful photograph by the photographer Marilyn Nance. Um, at one point, a lot of photographers snuck into the Audubon ballroom before they fixed it up and took pictures. And there's this incredible picture of all these chairs all in over. Very amazing. Now the next poem really is an invention, but not the person. Elio Otisica was a Brazilian um, conceptual artist. He was an amazing artist. Uh, one of those people that basically created some of the most dynamic um, art, art, some of the most dynamic art in uh, between 1960 and 1980. So, but you know, he lived in New York for a little while and, you know, sold dope and you know, did all kinds of things. And as uh, <laughs> a gallerist told me, he was also queer. But hey, this is my fantasy. So he is that Brazilian guy. Did I ever see Elio walk in some part East Village, curly-headed and densely packed with art and drugs and death's constant shadow? Was he on the corner of Avenue B and 10th Street drinking beer and ogling the pretty Puerto Rican girls? Was he ogling me? Or was he living in an abandoned warehouse, holding on to his pencil, pen, brush on paper, cardboard, found trash, or garment district fabrics offloaded by a gang out of the projects, whisking splatter of heroin? lost income. Drop 
dangling from a cup of bitches brew. Oh, how to speculate this mad Hendrix loving artist movements in El Barrio, Loisaida, or was he uptown, Spanish Harlem, or on the west side, Greenwich Village, hanging with the drag queens early AM, everybody tired from the bars, the piers, the crumbling edifices of late 60s, early 70s, Nueva York. He was on a wild ride, the weed his stash, the dazzled dreams of men who had survived torture, military repression, a bad economy. He had learned to take acid trips one day at a time. Oh, the love affairs we have with the myth of the what ifs and that drug paraphernalia. Oh, night seeker, ill named moon winds your direction. Thus created this mixed up third world. Loud music, your lips dry from screaming in January wind, something mighty Hendrix sun lack on a back meant for napping midday heat exhausted. Thus the making of a hammock, a thing of beauty, backlit by the gallerists while duct tapes coil the rafters of some street legal post, fly fishing flies, pretended bait, tight pants drop here and there, a thriving masquerade of the handsome Brazilian who could have been the best bad news boyfriend ever. Uh, and another Puerto Rican coming up. Uh, Self-portrait as Retratos de Costas Locas y de Locos, stolen. Uh, the is dedicated to Papo Colo, who is very much alive and well and making art somewhere between Puerto Rico and the Lower East Side. And uh, the title comes from a title of one of his pieces a self-portrait de cosas locos de locos. Anyway, <sighs> also this is a pre-pandemic poem because literally I saw Papa Colo a couple of years ago and we said, oh, we'll have cocktails soon. And then, well, shall we have cocktails while sipping the edge of catastrophe? Gin and tonic for summer, whiskey sour for fall, all is not well, yet sun illumines green leaf trees, soon bare, soon bare. Our eyes prowl fits edges for morning glory vines. Our ears gallop from the booming bass of pumped up cars. Our legs move as swiftly as a catamaran and duck. We mock the heavens with calls for paradise now. Artists perambulating the shadowed alloes, alleys of downtown Manhattan. Memories of dreams dulled in punk and rock clubs, filthy bathrooms. How much of what was is still now in the body, in the bones, in of the body. Calcium lost, teeth loose, wrists smaller, so all bracelets dangle, dangle. Lips call repeatedly a song whose words are traces of sentiment, yet sung too softly as if only whispers can make the world hear. Uh, Cassis is a town in the south of France, and I was there a couple of years ago when I left Aretha Franklin. Crying in Cassis for the Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin dead at 76. The queen of soul, breath gone on an August night, or was it early morning, near dawn? The queen of soul, whose brain was challenged by baby divas, with scurrying voices, rose up, but they never got near to her throne. She was born a citizen of a nation that called brown people queens and dukes and earls, and counts were rarely citizens. Born a citizen of a nation that found tongues loosened in a framed temple of justice, love, and recognizable rage. 
God's people vilified, God's people saved in rhythm rhyme, time kept better than the beating back of those who could not name the God they worshiped, mammon, or offer suffer to anyone not like themselves. Voice travels across hearts, doors, which once open could not be closed. Voice travels deep in the hippocampus, mocked and degraded, open up and hear these words, think, respect, trouble, love, respect, love, think, 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 love. French voices shout in the bright late afternoon. The Mediterranean sparkles today. It will sparkle tomorrow. But the heavens, oh, they will sparkle like never before. The queen of soul, the voice that marked and framed a generation of citizens American, then global soul in Dakar, Accra, Tunis, Johannesburg, Seoul in Marseille, Manchester, London, Paris, Berlin on the radio, in Cologne, Santiago, Tokyo, and Chiang Mai. Her voice trails Memphis, St. Louis, Chicago, Detroit, great migration in chords and harmonies, melodies, memorables, choruses repeated, trails of tenderness and terror. Woman on the road, body loved, betrayed, slapped about, salved with new kisses. Woman on the road, queen of the train tracks, bus routes, plane rides, car trips, the great migration circle of motion moving in her voice, a legacy, her star matters, brightly as Mars so keen to be seen this anim, battle weary resting. And my last poem is um, on the death of Clarabelle Alegria, but it's also dedicated to every poet, every woman poet who has stood up for what she believes in and cares about. And it ends with uh, her going off and joining Orion. On the death of Clarabelle Alegria, uh, she was a Salvadoran and Nicaraguan poet. 1924-2018. And I also want to thank Amber and Candace. You guys are, have been like making all of us look like we can dance. On earth, she marked her days with rage and love and fought the generals and the armies of thieves and torturers. Her pen was mighty, so also their arms. Death is the shadow twin the one remaining in the foothills, by the back door, in a convent, off a mountainside. And yet, the mother's breast awaits her infant's mouth. A rooster crows and children gather what food there is, while bells ring across foothills when the soldiers leave. A music of hope, even as another child is buried and a landmine erupts a few kilometers from hospital. We live in a time of suffering and places of pain, where the water and air meet in mountains, dark soil. Food grows so effortlessly and so does greed. We live in a time of suffering in places of beauty, where yesterday's rebel is today's president, and greed cowers the hurt children who hunger not only for their mother's milk, but a safe place where peace storms the land with smiles and the tender removal of all aspects of war. A phantasm of peace, a peace unlike the other ones, negotiated and then neglected, thus military rifles handguns, machetes, buoy knives, unexploded landmines, all made so that peace will end and terror return. What you hear is the sea. 
The heavy waves come in, go out. Stars pattern, Orion's belt, or is that his heel? And then another woman of letters depart. Will she step on Orion's heel? Would she say, excuse me, I did not see your heel. Would she try to hide her error as her celestial garments drag across the night sky? What if Orion could speak? And if he did, would he say, all the poets love my heel or my belt. You're not the first to seek anchor here. Thank all of you so very much. Thank you so much, yeah. Let us, you know, clap wherever we are for another powerful reading, uh, real poetry for social change, poetry for social justice, uh, poetry as the art of the possible, where uh, we, we are just really moved you know, uh, as, at how powerfully uh, inspirational and aspirational the three uh, readings uh, have been. Uh, wonderful words of wisdom uh, that just warm at our hearts. And as somebody said, they make us want to dance uh, at the same time that we want to laugh. Sometimes we want to cry uh, because of the way in which we have a diversity of issues, some of them joyful, others are sad, but we believe in black joy, as uh, one of our readers uh, said. So I will, at this time, I ask all of us to once again, thank our poet, our lady poets for uh, really moving uh, readings. Uh, personally, it has carried me across the oceans, uh, across countries, across languages, disciplines, uh, media. Uh, just, just really, really uh, amazing. And uh, we want to give you another uh, round of applause. And at this time, uh, we are going to take uh, questions. I'm sure you have some. I have uh, here on. QA, I see two, but one is really not a question, just looking for the closed captioning. Okay. Uh, the second one uh, is um, wow, I never knew what the term back lady really meant until now. I heard about the term from conceptual artists David Hammonds and Pry. This poem put so much more emphasis on that phrase. I hope we can discuss it more. Thank you so much for sharing your work. So what about Bag Lady? I think uh, this goes to our first lady poet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, so the, the Bag Lady remix, uh, I was invited by a good friend and colleague, Douglas Kearney, to uh, remix uh, a Erica Badu song and um, from her first album. And uh, I was assigned the song Bag Lady. And if it, anybody knows the, the song, the, the lyrical content has to do with, you know, um, not being able to let go of things, um, yeah. carrying too much ish, you got issues upon issues upon issues. And, you know, uh, there's the, the bad lady, you gonna miss your bus, you get too much stuff, you can't hurry up, <laughs> you know, and it's, and, and it's like, you know, uh, you know, in terms of you, you, you're not, able to succeed in relationships, whether they're re romantic relationships or friendships or familial relationships, because um, you're holding on to a lot of things and you need to let it go. 
Um, and so I looked at it and I, it was not my first choice, I'll say that. Um, because I think I, I began to uh, really look at myself and, um, <laughs> and go, do I really want to go there? Um, and, um, and so I just explored it. I explored uh, the changing body, the aging body, the mature body, the black body, the native body, the overweight body, the childless body, the unmarried body, um, and all of that stuff. And it's kind of like, okay, you know, I'm just going to flush this out, but using this refrain is you. Um, which comes from the Erica Badu song. Um, but then also that old uh, song, Is You, Is, or Is You, Is My Baby. I don't care. I don't know who sang it. But, um, but yeah, but it's, it's a play on both of those, but also in a Little Dragon song for folks who know the group Little, um, Little Dragon. Thank you so much. Um, Mariposa, you, you wanted to say something? Mariposa, you wanted to say something? I think I felt, no? Yes, I just, I saw one, one question um, in the Q&A where people can buy our work. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I was going to bring that, yeah. I was, but uh, you, you can wasn't sure. know that I was going to, to bring it as a last question, actually, because but oh, okay. you, you just, didn't give the information, yeah. I just want to say, I, I just want to say that um, I have known Latasha and Nevada Diggs um, and Patricia Spears Jones for a long time, and this pandemic has, it's, um, it's just, it really makes a difference to hear the poetry of my sister poets. And to share space and time together, even virtually, um, it just means so much. I feel so connected. And it's, it's not the same as being in a live audience where we could like vibe off of the audience. Um, but I feel like I'm vibing off of Amber and Candace. <laughs> I actually was a little distracted. I was mesmerized. Mm. I lost my place in some of my poems because I was like, wow, this is, I've never seen an um, ASL speaking spoken word artist because that's straight up art right there. Like yeah. ASL, yeah. I don't, I'm just really, <laughs> yeah. this I needed, this is like a vitamin, like a booster. Yeah. Um, I needed this and that's all I can say. <laughs> Thank you so much. It, it's quite impressive. It's the first time I have this experience too. It's just life transforming. Uh, please, if you could just um, uh, put in the chat, you know, information on where you get, uh, where we can get your work, that will be helpful so that we can go to the next question. Uh, what is it about Gwendolyn Brooks' poems that inspire you? And when did you discover her work? Well, since I was the person that brought up yeah, when I was outside, <laughs> I think yeah. every, I mean, I think almost every African American poet, every American poet, frankly, uh, it, it owes a great debt to um, to Brooks because she she was um, able to um, take her considerable skills and talent and explore with great depth and great respect and love the very lives of Black people. Mm -hmm. And she was, is, she's a master craftsperson. I mean, you know, she, her lines are extraordinary. And um, so if you're talking about craft, she's the one. If you're talking about certain kinds of invention, she's the one. If you're talking about um, the ability to absorb significant change within the community. She's the one. Um, and, but she always, she was literally from her teenagehood um, was, was involved 
in um, uh, pro-black activism in uh, in Chicago, uh, and she was just amazing. And uh, the reason why I kind of came, to, I'm from Arkansas originally, and one of her great poems is, and I'm going to probably uh, say this wrong. Uh, the Chicago Defender covers the goes to Little Rock, and it's about a black. It's the in the voice of a black uh, reporter who covers the Little Rock um, Nine and the riots, um, the white people going crazy uh, when nine black children went to the Central High in Little Rock, Arkansas, in 1957, and it's an extraordinary poem. And um, and and but it's also from uh, a perspective of of a black man, and every, you know and and she could do stuff like that. She could write about Winnie Mandela. She could write about, she could write about anybody. Uh, and she taught everybody from, you know, um, uh, graduate students to the Blackstone Rangers. She had no mm -hmm. fear. I think. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that that is why uh, we return to her uh, over and over again. Thanks a lot. Uh, the next question will be for all of you, really. How did you move from a space of writing to sharing? And from the same questioner, uh, was there a topic that spoken about constantly? And how did you move into the conversation with an original voice? That's a, Anybody can. There is really. That's a lot. Of, that's a whole. That's like five. Yeah. <laughs> that's five questions in a row. There. I don't. Marie Posta, what do you say? I. How I move from from writing to sharing my work. Writing to 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 sharing and from the the same person to, uh, you know, how. Uh, no, sorry. I was I was reading another one. It happened in my freshman year. From writing to, to sharing, that would be easy. It happened in my freshman year of college. And I see in the chat that, that Abby London is here and um, she's mentioning her husband, the late Mark Crawford, who is my professor when um, he taught creative writing at NYU and jazz appreciation. And um, it was the only creative writing course I took in college. Uh, I didn't come out of an MFA program. Uh, he gave one assignment that you had to write a, a stream of consciousness. I have one hour to live. And you had to really tell the truth and be honest. And you would read and if you were, if you were BSing, he'd make you sit down. And then also in that year, um, there was an open mic and a friend of mine said, hey, I, I was invited to, to read and I can't make it, you know, can you go? And I remember shaking and um, actually I started to memorize my poems because um, I would get so nervous that my, my hands would shake and you could see the paper shaking. <laughs> you could see the paper shaking, but it, it was a long time and there was a transition between saying I write poetry to saying I am a poet. So to all the people and to you who ask that question, if you ask that question because maybe you're writing and not sharing, I say that the world needs to hear your voice, that your voice matters and just you know share your work even if you feel shaky and afraid. Yeah, the, the question was uh, from Aziz Alimi who I think is a budding writer because he or she also asked, was there a topic spoken about constantly? And how did you bring your own original voice to that topic? So it's the same person who asked both questions. So I'm assuming uh, they are interested in writing or they're writing already. Um, well, I guess uh, I'm, I'm, I'm being very quiet because um, I, I I'm, I, I need a little bit more clarity with that question in terms of like what you mean by a common topic. Mm. Um, like, like, are we, you know, a top, it's 
like, are we talking about hair texture? Are we talking about skin color? Mm. Are we talking about uh, body shaming? Are we talking about neighborhoods? I mean, topics are broad and, um, and so, you know, forgive me for uh, hesitating to answer it. I think um, how you dive into it is, is how you dive into it. I think um, in the case of like the haiku, I didn't set out to, talk, uh, to write haiku about hot flashes, all right? <laughs> it, was, it was actually, um, I was invited to write a haiku uh, that uh, responded but didn't respond to the Gil Scott Herring poem, Pieces of a Man. And um, I was assigned just to write a haiku. Um, uh, but for uh, poets, we know that you never write one poem, right? You write, you may write a couple of poems before you get to the poem that you like, that you want to share. And um, I wrote five and I shared it with a friend. And then my friend shared his five and then I, then I said, oh, I want to respond to your five. And we started going back and forth via email, <laughs> responding to each other's haikus. And I think mm. he ended up with 14 and I ended up with 27 haiku. Okay, that's not, <laughs> that okay. is not ideally what you want to do if you have to choose one. But the subject changed because I was responding and then all of a sudden then, yeah, the hot flashes started coming and it was like, oh yeah, okay, so I'm late, I'm in panties. And it was like, oh, that makes sense within the context of a haiku. Um, so um, I think, yeah, I, I think, I hope that helps yeah. um, in uh, giving you some sense of, mm. um, where you could go, you could go anywhere. You really yeah. can. I mean, in terms of like writing about something that's already been written, uh, I mean, where do you want to start? Um, I mean, uh, there's probably thousands of poems that deal with the same topic over and over again. Uh, yeah. There are poems about the grieving uh, the death of a parent, you know, or cancer. Um, it's, 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 it's for you to figure out how to um, explore that topic. Okay, thank you so much. We're a little over time, so I'll just take one last question. Uh, could you all, which is very timely, could you all let us know what it has been like for you not to read publicly during the pandemic? Could you let us know what you've been up to? What are you writing, not writing at this time of uh, the coronavirus pandemic? That would be our last questions. The others have been, read, uh, have been answered to about uh, the recording of the event and uh, yeah, Mariposa's work. So could we quickly just uh, address pre-pandemic, pandemic and post-pandemic writing? Well, I, you know, I think, I think it's the writing is the writing. So I'm, I, I find that kind of thing, what did you do before? You, you know. <laughs> uh, we're always in crisis in some way or another, and this is just a different kind of crisis. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the, the interconnection by, by a Zoom actually has been extraordinarily helpful, I think, for a lot of people. We can indeed uh, read to people who are thousands of miles away from us. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do miss uh, uh, in-person uh, reading, and I look forward to doing that again. Uh, every, all three of us are excellent readers of our work and other people's work as well. Uh, and so it's um, kind of difficult, but it also gives us a chance to, you know, I mean, talk to people who are in, in you know, in California or in Paris uh, right now. So. That is kind of amazing. Uh, I think we all should just kind of think about the fact that we've been given a pause to do some very serious self-reflection about who we are and what we want. Uh, and that one of the reasons why there was a worldwide 
social justice movement last year was precisely because of that level of pause, that people had thought about what they wanted to put their bodies on and on the line for. And, uh, and today there is an actual, you know, a guilty verdict, thank God, uh, in, in uh, Minneapolis. So I think what we need to do is to think about, we are in the business, if you, I hate to use the word business, we're, we tell the truth in different kinds of ways through language. That's what we do. And every time we have a chance to like think about what that is, and to sit on it, and to care about it, and to not worry that we gotta make it, gotta get on the subway right now to make a gig at two hours from now, and the subway stops, we're screwed up, is a good thing. Uh, but it is difficult. It is very, very difficult. Because all three, all three of us are perform. I mean, are performers in different kinds of ways. So that's hard. Thank you. One of the hard things is, is the impact that it's had on being able to collaborate with musicians. And um, Ross Moshe, I don't know, I thought I saw his name right before the pandemic. We, 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 were, we had kicked off, we had launched a juke joint series that we were gonna do poetry and jazz juke joints and take it on the road. <laughs> and we're gonna do it, we're, even if we have to, you know, we can figure it out virtually. Um, but to, to be accompanied by a musician while you're reading with a delay of Zoom, I don't know how to do that. I agree with Patricia that we're always in crisis and um, sometimes what I, in the pandemic, I've gone to drawing, I'll draw trees or I'll paint flowers if the words don't come. Um, it takes a little time to process, but the, but the, the writing is the writing. I, I agree with Patricia. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Latasha? Latasha, oh, yeah. Yeah, I will. I will. I will try to be brief, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, honest. Uh, during I froze, uh, and I and I say this during the very beginning, um, the earlier part of um, this crisis, and yes, we're always in crisis. This this was this was our this was our um, <laughs> our, 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 our a major crisis of many crises, and um, I, I I froze um, and I forgave myself um, and I and I and I allowed myself to take a pause because simply I I could not match. Um, the work ethic of some of my dear friends. Um, and, I, and I had to say, I'm not in competition. No one is in competition, especially right now. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Um, you, you simply cannot. We have to figure out how to continue to live, right? Literally. Um, and, and then, then through that, uh, through the crises, through the things that followed the deaths, the demonstrations, there was a moment of real frustration and anger and rage. Um, and I had to figure out how to funnel that into some type of um, creative outlet. So working with stop motion animation, working with video, um, being very fortunate to be on my friend's land and just make videos of myself chopping wood. And chopping wood was actually very cathartic because I got the rage out chopping wood, you know? <laughs> Meanwhile, my friend got some yeah. chopped wood. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it was like I chopped the wood. She didn't have to chop the wood in the winter time. It was done, you know. Um, you know, and I got to make an art piece out out of that. Um, so um, I had to, you know, figure that out. Thinking about, you know, all types of manifestos. Uh, you know, use what you got right in front of you to create work. Right, that's it. Um, and 
now I'm getting into some type of slow practice back. Um, I would say one of the things that has been an absolute blessing with the Zoom medium, because I have to say at first, I hated it. My eyes were going nutty. My eyes were going <laughs> blurry. I got red tinted glasses. I got orange tinted glasses. I got yellow tinted glasses. It was too much. Yeah, yeah, for the blue screen, right? One of the absolute beauties, right? Because it's, again, thinking about this as a creative platform, thinking of this as an actual tool, right? We have the beauty of ASL. We have the beauty of close captioning, right? When you can actually, you know, afford actually someone who can actually do it, not the auto close captioning. And those become performers as well as bandmates, as well as part of the craft of um, interpreting your work, right? Adding another layer to your work that you may have not ever seen before. As a curator, as a curator, part of the La Casita Festival, we always have ASL, right? Um, because it's extremely important to make sure that we include that community, that population, right? There are ASL poets. There's a vibrant spoken word ASL community in New York. Um, and when you see them interpret their poems, there is a magic that happens. There is a communication that's happening that you've never, that you never, it's, it's different from hearing it, right? Sometimes seeing, seeing the interpreter perform, right? And I say perform, not, 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 not as a loose thing, but perform and talk in their, in their language, it's just another texture. It's another way of seeing the words, seeing, seeing the visuals um, and getting the senses, right? Um, one of my favorite performances was this indigenous poet from Canada and her poem was making fun of the Pope where she called him poop, right? And she was talking about an old man's, and forgive me for anyone who finds this insulting, an old man's hanging testicles. And the way the ASL interpreter interpreted that, <laughs> everybody was on the floor dying. That would not have happened without the presence of ASL. So Zoom allows us to add this other layer to it. And I'm so fortunate that Lehman and literary uh, Ron and y'all made it happen because I love, I love ASL. Thank you so much, Latasha. We celebrate the silver linings of Zoom, you know, and uh, I, I'm sure all of you want to join me to give the Good night, round of applause to our wonderful, wonderful poets. And we will do this again in person and Zoom. Okay, so Robert and Ron, do you have uh, any last word? Okay, so thank you so much. Just thank you to everybody. Your generous comments and readings uh, that will really uh, stay with us forever, you know. Thank you so much and good night. And sign language. The first time I've had uh, sign language during a poetry reading and it's just amazing. You know, oh, yeah. that other dimension. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Mariposa for the hard work, Robert, Ron, and our three lady wordsmith and word crafters. Mariposa. Thank you. Patricia and Latasha. We'll be inviting you again on campus, on our beautiful campus. Thank you so very much. I, I, uh, thank you, Mariposa. This is thank you, name. Patricia. And thank you, thank thank you, you Women's Studies, Women Studies Program and Africana Studies Program. Thank you, Center for Humanities, yes. Latasha, everyone. And our interpreters. And interpreters. Yeah, amazing. <laughs>